Good afternoon. Today I'm going to get deeper into what I started in the last lecture, giving you more of a roadmap for what the methods actually are that we are using today in real applications with RLADP. I'm going to start out with a slide I introduced at the end of the last lecture. This is extremely important. This is another one of these cognitive map slides to help you organize your understanding of this very complicated field. When you have a concrete application where you want to use RLADP, you have to make four decisions. And if you want to understand all the many papers that are out there which seem to be using different RLADP methods. If you want to make sense of them, it's very important to consider these papers along these four dimensions. How did they make these four decisions? And again, this is actually a quick summary of more details that are available in Chapter 1 of Lewis and Liu. The four big decisions Three of them involve the value function, which could be j, or lambda, or something like j. There's a question of which do you choose, j, or lambda, or q. There's a question of how do you train the parameters in the function which approximates them. And there's the question of which function do you use to try to approximate these value functions. The fourth question is, even after you have J, how do you do what the Bellman equation calls for? How do you pick actions U to try to maximize this, to take advantage of the value function to make decisions? Now, with four different variables of choice, and many choices for each of the four, that adds up to a lot of methods. It begins to sound like a statistics textbook. One of the reasons why I'm grateful for you in taking this class is that it's important that we in this field begin to do some of the things that statisticians have done, which is put together user-oriented software that gives people a choice across the many methods which have proven useful in applications in the past. There are a lot of times when a professor says, gee, I heard these methods might be useful somehow, you, graduate student, why don't you go out and see how well they work? And sometimes people will go out, grab the simplest form of reinforcement learning in MATLAB, same thing with neural networks, and they'll find a kind of simplified textbook from somewhere in the AI community. There are some simplified textbooks out there. And I'll come back and say, well, reinforcement learning is too slow to be useful. You can find some pretty good textbooks which will tell you that. They don't always tell you that there are many reinforcement learning methods. And in my view, even brains use reinforcement learning. It can handle a lot of complexity. And it can be fast enough to be useful, but only if you pick the right method. And that's why people need to get into these details to know the methods, and to work on software packages to make it easier for the next people to find and use the right method. So that's a critical goal of this course, is to create new kinds of training for people who can span this diversity, which is really critical. So these are the four decisions. Now, in describing the existing methods, I can talk in more detail about these four questions, and I have to, and I can give examples. But it's important that ADP is not just like statistics, a collection of 100 chapters. There's also a larger theme here. The ADP methods we use today are like a statistics textbook in a way. There are a set of methods, I'll talk about them. My chapter, Lewis and Lude, talks about them. But RLADP is not only the methods we are using today. 
It's also a pathway to more powerful methods in the future. In essence, the mathematics of RLADP are the same as the mathematics of what it takes to build a real brain-like intelligent system. So, on the one hand, we're talking about specific algorithms for specific problems, but we're also talking about how to build intelligent systems. And there are levels and levels of intelligent systems. There are reinforcement learning systems, which I think can be regarded as universal intelligent learning machines. They can converge to an optimal strategy of action if they have enough time and if they are complex enough. But some reinforcement learning methods can handle more complexity than others. And as you learn more complicated methods, you get closer to the kind of universal capability we see in a brain, and we really need to bring that into software. So today I'll be talking about these four questions. I'll be talking about intelligent systems in general, and then at the end of the lecture I'm going to get down to some brass tacks. I'm going to give you some beginning examples of mathematics so that you have some exercises to get your teeth into so you know that this is not all words. So last time I started out by talking about the ways you can choose actions and all of these are being chosen by different people. But what I'd like to point out is that if you want to build a universal intelligent system there are only two of these six that really represent what a brain would do in the general case. The simplest of them is the idea of an action network. We have neural networks in the brain. We have timing constraints in the brain. We need to train the parameters of our hardware, even if it sells, to get the best possible actions in a fixed amount of time. And it makes sense that building ADP systems around action networks, it sounds as if that should be the most general way to do things. And when I got my PhD, I thought this model would be good enough to describe what happens in brains. But then, in the mid-90s, I learned more about brains and about challenging problems. And I learned that to really understand the kind of thing that goes on in the mammal brain, you need to use a more complicated hybrid that exploits something I would call brain-like stochastic search. So that you have action nets, which are like networks of habits and work in predictable time. But you also have added a kind of a creativity system that has an ability to think of new options. And that's a critical part of the design of intelligent systems. A certain kind of additional creativity system. It's not like, it's not exactly evolutionary computing, because you have to learn how to come up with new options. It's not just by, um, well, replication and breeding. You need to learn how to find interesting options, but the brain clearly has mechanisms for doing that. So for brain-like intelligence systems, this is sort of the bottom of the ladder, a certain level of intelligence, and a higher level is this creativity thing. Now, where I ended up last time, is getting into brass tacks for what people working right now most need to be aware of. We need to be aware of the different types of value function. I've spoken about them a little bit already. There are value approximation systems that approximate the regular J star function of the Bellman equation. I mentioned heuristic dynamic programming, HDP, which I developed a long, long time ago, 40 years ago. Globalized DHP, which is the best system when you have a mix of continuous and discrete variables. It's also approximating J star, but it uses gradient information to improve the quality of the approximation, the quality of the learning. There is also a term called temporal difference methods, TD, which is basically the same as HDP. Uh, and it was published with citation of the earlier work on HDP. Um, I don't think the extension is that important, but I can talk about it. Um, and these are all discussed in a book by Miller, Sutton, and Werbos, 1990. 
So far as I know, there have been big applications of GDHP in logistics. There have been some machine learning applications of pure HDP, like in playing backgammon, inspired by particularly the work of Bartow. But HDP as such has not been really such a big field for practical applications. It's more the GDHP and um, that's pretty much it. The next set of methods is dual heuristic programming. I call it dual heuristic programming because it uses the dual vector lambda, which is very much the same as the lambda vector you see in a lot of control theory and economics. Uh, it's called a vector of duals. And this has led to the best performance in really tough problems involving continuous variables. There's a paper by one should all I've recommended, some work on missile interception by Balakrishnan I talked about, and on aircraft maneuvers by Stengel and Ferrari. And I might add, Stengel of Princeton is one of the world's leading aerospace control engineers. I mentioned his textbook on optimal control before. Uh, and yet he was able to show that with DHP, he could get better performance on aircraft maneuvers than all the previous existing methods for which he is one of the world's experts. A third kind, which I mentioned last time, is Q or J prime, action dependent HDP. In the lookup table case, that's Q learning. In the more general case, it's action dependent HDP. And in that case, you maximize a function which is really closely related to J. I've got the formula right here. It's just U of U and X plus the expected value of J star in the next time period. Very simple function of J star. But the interesting thing is this is a function of action directly. So if you approximate J prime, then you only need to figure out U to maximize this function. You don't work through a model. And one of the reasons people have used this in some important engineering applications is that it doesn't require a model at all. It's not as powerful as DHP. Balakrishnan reports, DHP is not so sensitive to the details of the model. He's experimented in cases where the model was not that close at all. You still get very robust performance out of DHP. But in ADHTP, there is no model at all. DHP can handle more complexity, but ADHDP does a lot better than traditional things, better than Q-learning, better than traditional dynamic programming. Um, one of the best examples of ADHDP I mentioned before was in the Handbook of Intelligent Control by White and Sofji, who solved the problem of how to make composite carbon-carbon parts. This is extremely important in practical applications. The aircraft industry spent maybe a billion dollars trying to figure out how to make thermoplastic carbon-carbon parts for use in high-performance aircraft. When White and Softy worked on this, they were with McDonnell Douglas, which made the F-15 fighter, and a huge part of the cost of that fighter airplane was the growing percentage of high quality parts which they needed to get performance but cost a lot of money and it was very hard to make those parts cheaply they came up with a good physical process with lasers but the physical process involved nonlinear control and the classical nonlinear control methods had problems with that as did the classic AI methods and finally when they applied ADP they were able to mass produce it and that has something to do with the Boeing Dreamliner. And there's, there are other examples. Um, there is a Lambda Prime critic, which is very much like J Prime. It's basically just the gradient of J Prime. And this is described in the Handbook of Intelligent Control. It hasn't been used in major practical applications, but it does have some use, which is described in Chapter 13 of the Handbook, which is up on my website. There's something called the Error Critic, which may be critical to the way brains learn how to predict. And Prokhorov, when he was at Ford, did run some simulations showing that this performs better than other methods they had tried. But they didn't have much incentive 
at Ford to go ahead further because the existing neural network methods were already powerful enough for what they needed to do. But it's very interesting early work. It's an opportunity for someone in the future. So now in general, what I hope you will learn in this course are exactly these four methods, how to implement them, and what's involved, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and how to recognize them when people reinvent them as they do regularly. Uh, and it's important to recognize when there are ten different papers actually doing the same thing because that makes it easier to learn from the experience. But there are other types of value functions besides these four. This is the present state of the art. There is also the future. And for the future, one thing I did back in 1998 was develop modified Bellman equations to deal with multiple time intervals. There are people in robotics who have to deal with multiple time intervals all the time. There are a lot of people in robotics who talk about things like learning a skill or learning a behavior. So if you want a robot to do something very complicated, you usually need to do it in terms of a hierarchy. So the robot may have ten skills. It may know how to turn a screw. It may know how to put two pieces together. Uh, it may know how to pull them apart. It may know how to move them. And to perform complex tasks, there have to be two levels of learning, roughly. There has to be the ability to learn to turn the screw effectively. But there also has to be the higher level ability to know which skill to use in what order. So there are two multi-stage optimization problems. There's the problem of which skill to implement on what objects, and then there's the optimization problem for each skill, how to execute the task or the skill correctly. For those of you interested in psychology, there's a classic book by Miller, Galanter, and Prebrum, which talks about tasks and the structure of behavior. In order to do an optimal job with multiple time periods, it turns out the Bellman equation is not numerically the best way to do it. Numerically, it works a lot better if you can define modified Bellman's equations and use them to structure multi-level learning systems, which are not as rigid as the old AI systems, but have some of that flavor, that, that chunk multiple time intervals which lets you do task learning and lets you modify the task according to different objects you might act on. So there are modified Bellman equations which do that. There are also ways of combining J and Lamb to together in hybrids of these methods because the optimal control system usually ends up being a hybrid. If you want to use a model but you don't want to totally trust the model Maybe what you want to do in an ideal world is a kind of a hybrid. And of course, we need flexible software. These are all important things for the future. But for this class, I'm mainly going to focus on these methods with a single time period because we need to master them. They're the foundation for these more advanced things in the future. But I hope some of you will go on to the future tasks as well. Now finally, to describe the existing methods, the third big decision is, um, I, and I might add that last slide, I was implicitly talking about the methods for adapting the parameters for these different kind of value functions. And I will get into those methods pretty soon. But, but to complete the overall survey, we have to consider different ways of approximating the value function. And here I have a list of the methods that people commonly use. The oldest method is to approximate value through a kind of lookup table. You assume the world only has n possible states and you want to estimate the value of being in any one of them. And that's what traditional dynamic programming did. There's a good, useful literature on that. It's very suggestive. The formal mathematics helps inform us about things that also apply in the more complicated world of continuous variables, but it's really just background. A slightly more practical approach 
is to use something a lot like regression. For example, you have the lambda sub i value measures for each of the things you need to place values on, and you could approximate them as a linear weighted combination of the input variables. This looks exactly like a standard multiple regression equation in statistics, and we are adapting the weights w, and that's the way they describe it in statistics. In neural networks and statistics, we talk about picking the weights w or adapting the weights w for optimal performance. But the problem is most decision problems are not quite so simple. Even linear dynamic systems end up typically with nonlinear value systems. Think of LQR, where you wind up having quadratic value measures. So this is really not used that I've seen in anything useful. The first moderately serious value function approximator in the new age is a linear basis function approximator. And it's important to look at this equation, I hope you have the slides handy, where you approximate lambda i, for example, or j, as a weighted sum of some basis functions, phi sub j of x. This is exactly like the way people used to do object recognition a few years ago. A few years ago, the best state of the art in pattern recognition was to work very hard as humans to come up with feature vectors. What are the right features? And then use the numerical methods to put the right weights on different features to recognize an object. And people would spend entire lives trying to develop good feature vectors for different applications. But just in the last couple of years, there has been a revolution in the world of pattern recognition, which is important to what we're trying to do here. Common sense would tell you that if your learning system could learn to improve the features, it should be able to do better than if you just hold these things rigidly. Brains have to learn the features they use in recognizing patterns or in forming strategies. We know the essence of learning in the brain, that the most important part of it, is what some people call deep learning or representation learning, where you learn the features. You learn what are the important things to look for in recognizing objects or in formulating strategies. In object recognition, uh, it's worth looking up the breakthroughs of these people, particularly Schmidhuber, Lecune, and Andrew Ung. Schmidhuber from Switzerland, Lecune now from New York, before Bell Labs, and Ung from Stanford. And these three folks, just in the last few years, have broken the world's records on any number of object recognition challenges involving thousands of input variables. In the old days, people said neural networks can only handle 30 to 50 inputs. But they are using neural networks which process thousands upon thousands of input variables. I think they're reaching the megapixel video domain right now. And they've broken all the world's records with systems which learn the features. So it's a complete learning system. And in order for us to build really powerful control systems for complex systems, we need to do the same. The critical part of solving complex control problems, like power grids, when you're trying to control the entire grid, and there are hundreds or thousands of variables, is to learn the same kind of tricks they have used and apply them so that you learn the features instead of just specifying them beforehand. Another common sort of value function is piecewise linear or quadratic. Two good examples of that are the work of Warren Powell in logistics, some of the best work in operations research for logistics in the world, the best world's performance on some of his benchmark problems. But there's also a paper by Ludmila Werbos and others in Neural Networks 2012, piecewise linear or quadratic value functions, it's not as good an approximation as a general nonlinear approximator. And even the linear basis functions could do better. But they have a unique value. When you have a linear or quadratic uh, 
value function, you can pick the actions you by using an existing optimization package like Garobi or a linear programming package. That gets back to my earlier slide on how do you pick the actions you. And if you have the kind of problem where you need to take the time to find the very best action variable at each stage of the decision, if you have the need for that and the time to do it, in that case you may want to pick a form of the value function which these packages can understand. And that's useful for some purposes. But in the long term, if you want to build up to brain-like intelligence, you really need to focus on the two major choices here. We need to build up to being able to use general nonlinear function approximators. For a universal learning system, it's not really a universal learning system if you can't approximate a general nonlinear function. So this is the case that gives you something like universal intelligence. A corollary of that is we can't go using Garobi. We have to come up with things like nonlinear programming packages in order to be compatible with these critics if we want to find the global optimum uh, and if we want to define our actions through a, a classic optimization package. So general nonlinear function approximators. Now there are a lot of people who have been interested in approximating dynamic programming who ask themselves how do we approximate a nonlinear function? And a lot of people feel, oh, I know how to do that, I'll use a Taylor series. I learned that in college. That's the scientific mathematical way to approximate a nonlinear function. Some people in aerospace would say, well, I know how to approximate a nonlinear function, I'll use gain scheduling. It's good enough if you have two or three variables. There are even some people who say, well, I'll use an associative memory. But it turns out all of these things have very severe limitations. For problems with many inputs, where you really do vary across those inputs, the most powerful standard technique available today is to approximate the value functions using a multi-layer perceptron, MLP, which is a kind of artificial neural network. And in a, one lecture or two from now, we'll talk a lot more about multi-layer perceptrons, where they came from, how we adapt them. But the bottom line is, these are probably the most popular form of artificial neural network out there today. And they do have some connection with what we know about biology, historically. Very important to this field are some approximation theorems proven by Andrew Barron of Yale. Uh, Andrew Barron of Yale was chairman of the statistics department of Yale at the time he published these classic seminal papers. In those days, many people had proven theorems showing that Taylor series, rational polynomials, all these things can approximate an arbitrary nonlinear function. They've proven they are able to function, to approximate nonlinear functions, but they hadn't done work on how much it costs. And it turns out that most of the popular methods for approximating nonlinear functions suffer from a curse of dimensionality. That means the cost of maintaining your accuracy rises exponentially with the number of input variables. So if you have 10 input variables, imagine 10 to the 10th. Of course, if you use lookup tables or gain scheduling to approximate a nonlinear function, it's easy to see why it's an exponential rise. If you try to approximate a function of 10 variables by simply creating a giant smooth lookup table of 10 variables, that's 10 dimensions, 10 things on each, you've got 10 to the 10th numbers. It's a lot of numbers. And that's a problem not just because of cost, but because of how you use data. It's hard to learn from a finite amount of experience if every case looks different to you because it's a different cell in your lookup table. 
What Barron showed was that all of the linear basis function methods that are out there, from associative memory to radial basis functions to splines to Taylor series, they all have the same problem of exponential growth in cost if you want to maintain a level of accuracy. However, Barron also proved that for smooth functions, functions with hat which have a kind of Lipschitz bound in mathematical terms, for smooth functions, he proved that the cost within multilayer perceptron rises very gently. It's something like the one-third power of the number of inputs. It's a very gentle increase. And so in practice, what that means is that if you only have two or three input variables, you can use whatever is easiest for you. But once you get up to numbers like 10 input variables, you better start using something like an MLP. And it may be hard to train, but you better learn how to train it if you want to handle that level of complexity with any level of accuracy. Now there are cases of people using associative memory, or something called CMAC, but that works if you do not experience the full richness of your 10-dimensional space. If you spend most of your time in the neighborhood of a few prototype special cases, then an associative memory network can give you a good enough approximation near those cases. But if you want to have control which is reasonably reliable across the whole of your state space with only 10 variables, you already start to need multilayer perceptrons. Now let me stress, Linear basis functions are not the only approximators people use. There's some people in operations research that are very excited by rational polynomials. They have some power that Taylor series don't. But, by definition, a polynomial, you're talking about one variable over one variable. And what's more, if you're doing things on modern chips and you don't want them to blow up because of strange ratios, uh, there are a lot of disadvantages to using polynomials. There's also something called elastic fuzzy logic, which I won't talk about now, though I have some papers on it. I would conjecture that elastic fuzzy logic is just as good as the multilayer perceptron, but nobody's proven that yet. That's an exercise for the mathematician. So this is the best we can do, but it's still only 30 to 50 input variables. And if it's only good for like 30 to 50 input variables, when you've got a highly nonlinear process, you might ask, how in the world did Schmidt, Huber, and Likud manage to deal with hundreds of thousands of variables as their inputs? And the answer is that they used a more complex kind of neural network, which does more justice to the kind of neural networks we have in the brain, in my view. It's a long story, what we think is in the brain. And so, there are more universal neural networks which can handle more spatial complexity. Crudely speaking, a quick summary is we're talking about things called convolutional networks, cellular simultaneous recurrent networks, and object networks. There's a paper by Cosma, Ilan, and myself in the Transaction of Neural Nets that gives an overview of these types of neural nets. So if we want to approximate value functions of thousands of variables in the general case, in a general purpose optimization package, we pretty much have to move forward to implementing these kinds of networks in a context where other people can use the software without having to know all the neural networks. So these are the choices.